Okay. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Friends of San Pedro Valley Parks Life Sciences Series. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mila Stroganoff, Program Director and your webinar host. And today's lecture with Amarok Weiss is entitled The Return of the Wolf. Um, I have excellent news. This lecture will be recorded and will be available on our website, website in a couple of weeks. As a reminder, please write questions in the Q&A section and not chat, and we'll get to as many questions as time permits. The Peregrine Sangha, which was last month, was not recorded. We did not receive permission from the lecturer to do so. Uh, but an article summarizing the lecture is available on the website. As always, a big thank you goes to Adrian, my husband, for all technical support and all mistakes to boot. Okay? Yeah? So, um, uh, <laughs> as as far, as far as the upcoming programs, uh, I've been busy and on April the 15th at 4 p.m. will be Lifeways of the Ohlone Indians. Ah, ah May, 5th, uh, May 15th, sorry. May 15th at 4 p.m. will be Lifeways of the Ohlone Indians of the San Francisco and Monterey Bay area with Mark Hilkema, supervisor of the cultural resource program for the Santa Cruz district of California State Parks. And we will step back in time to 1769 to learn about the archeology span and ethnography of the ancestral Ohlone people and about the native lifeways that once flourished in our neighborhoods and relive the experiences of the first Spanish explorers. So please mark your calendars. And on June the 5th at 4 p.m. will be all about monarch butterflies. We will have two wonderful children's programs during the summer months, one in July, one in August in San Pedro Valley Park itself. And so bring, so bring along your children and grandchildren and they'll have a grand time. The Friends of San Pedro Valley Park have a lovely website. It's called friendsofsanpedrovalleypark.org and it's a wonderful source of information regarding San Pedro Valley Park. It's trails, flora, fauna, Archival newsletters are up there and upcoming programs, uh, plus recordings of past webinars. Not all of them, but quite a few. Um, and the Friends produce a bi-monthly newsletter, which will be emailed when you become a member. And you can become a member online or by sending in a check. Consider joining and supporting us and becoming part of the Friends family. We're here in Pacifica. We'd love to have you join us. Um, and now I wish to introduce our eminent speaker. Amarok Weiss is the senior West Coast Wolf Advocate for the Center for Biological Diversity. A biologist and former attorney, Amarok has worked on wolf issues in the Northern Rockies, Alaska, the Southwest, Pacific West, and at the federal level for more than 23 years. Her chief focus is recovery and protection of wolves federally and in the three West Coast states. The organization for whom Amarok works, the Center for Biological Diversity, is a national nonprofit conservation organization that works to protect endangered species in wild places through science, law, and creative media. And without further ado, here is Amarok. Weiss. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here today. And as you all know, today I'm going to talk about wolves. But first, we are going to go see some wolves together at Yellowstone National Park. It's April 17th, six in the morning. It's 25 degrees out. We're in our car. We've arrived at our destination, a shoulder alongside the road in the Lamar Valley, deep in the heart of the park. We turn off the car, quietly gather our gear, very quietly get out of the vehicle and make sure that we don't slam the doors. We set up our spotting scopes, 
and we have them aimed on the broad expanse of meadow in front of us and the hillside beyond that. For the next 20 minutes, we watch through our spotting scopes. Nothing. 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 There, there's an elk coming over a ridge, covering ground as fast as it possibly can. Seconds later, a wolf pack appears in full pursuit. Two of the wolves quickly gain ground as the elk stumbles, then recovers. The rest of the pack fans out, ready to cut in or out if the elk cuts left or right. Three of the wolves seem to glance at each other, splinter off, disappear from view, and then reappear almost in front of the elk. Another ridge top, another stumble, another recovery, and then the entire drama disappears from view as the elk cuts left and the wolves follow it into the forest. The 15 minutes before, that elk had been but one in a herd of elk. And the wolves' arrival, it had been preceded by the sound of their paws on crusted snow, and also by the warm scent of their breath and their fur. The entire herd had smelled the predators coming from miles away, pricked their ears at the sound of paws coming closer, and then the herd had begun to run. Nearly every elk had been able to stay one step ahead, one breath ahead of the wolves. Even the elk that the wolves targeted, though they thought it was the most vulnerable, escaped. As happens 90% of the time that wolves go hunting. The wolf and the elk have perfected each other. The forces in each have driven the other. The wolf's speed and agility, that has driven the hearing and sense of smell and the fleetness of the elk. And this is a drama that has been going on for thousands of years. This is not just a wolf pack chasing an elk. These are the forces of nature, the most powerful, the most dramatic. And when we see them, it makes our hearts race. Everyone knows the thrill of what it is like to see these animals in the wild, in motion, to feel that grace and that power. Everyone knows that kind of awe. Well, this drama is coming to a theater near you. And actually, wait, it's already here. We have a two-year-old wolf on the central coast of California right now. Tomorrow, you may have a wolf on your doorstep. There is a, what? There's someone at the door? Hunt. Can you get that? I'm doing a program. Thanks. What? There's a wolf at the door? Well, I don't know. Ask him what he wants. He, he wants to know if we've seen any female wolves around. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet he does. Um, this is totally wondrous. Wolves have started to return to Oregon, to Washington, to California. The first wolf families here in 50 to 100 years. And you know what? Give me a moment. I'm going to pull up a photo of this wolf that is just here on our doorstep. Oops. Not that. Let's try that again. Huh. This wolf is being a little elusive right now. So if you'll just bear with me for a moment, hopefully we'll get him here. Hmm. You had him twice. I know. <laughs> He's disappearing. Let's see. Try this again. Okay, so he's here. And no, we keep going to the very end. Well, there always has to be a little bit of a technical glitch in a show, or it wouldn't be a show, right? So. Let me see what's going on here. And 
Oh my goodness. So I don't know what's going on, but I'm gonna run through all of my slides backwards and we're gonna to get to the front because that's just how life is. Coming up, the elusive wolf is about to show up. There he is, okay, there's our man. So this is a wolf that you have all been reading about in the news so much lately. This is OR93. And he came here from Oregon the end of January, stepped into California for a day, went back into Oregon, came back into California in early February just to get to the Oregon-California border. He traveled 300 miles from his birthplace because he was born all the way up the Cascades in Northern Oregon, just south of Mount Hood and his pack territory. He's from the White River Pack and his pack territory, part of it is on the reservation the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs. And this beautiful photo of him was taken by one of the tribal biologists at the time that they radio collared him. So his travels have made absolute international news for good reason, because he has now traveled through 18 California counties. He has traveled the furthest south of any known wolf in modern times in California, making his way all the way down to Yosemite. And then he turned west and he has reached the central coast of California, making him the first reported wolf on the coast in almost 200 years. And to make his way to the coast, think about this. Once he left the Yosemite area, he traveled across these wide open agricultural valleys where he would have been totally visible, but nobody saw him across Fresno County and then San Benito County. And then he made his way into Monterey County and most recently, he's been reported in San, San Luis Obispo County. And then think further, what else did he have to go across to get there? Some of California's busiest roadways. In Fresno County, he crossed Highway 99. In Monterey County, or San Benito County rather, he crossed I-5. And in San Benito County, then he made his way across, or I'm sorry, Monterey County, he made his way across Highway 101. Uh, did he actually cross these roads or did he find a culvert underneath or an under creek crossing? We don't know. We just know he made his way across there. And so far he's traveled at least a thousand miles and he is still on the move. He is part of a wave of, of great adventurers that are coming down to us from the north. And this wave began in 2011 when a wolf called OR7, or Journey, made his way into California. He was called OR7 because he was the seventh wolf to have been radio collared by the agency biologists in Oregon at that time. And when he was two and a half years old, he left his birth pack, the Imnaha pack, in far northeastern Oregon, all the way up in Wallowa County. And he spent the next two months traveling across some of Oregon's wildest country places that are designated as wilderness or wilderness study areas. And then he made his way across the Cascades, becoming literally the first confirmed wolf west of the Cascades in 60 years. He spent about six weeks in that general area near Crater Lake and Sky Lakes Wilderness, which is really gorgeous land if you ever have a chance to go up there and see what journey saw. And then at some point, he decided to head south. And so he came south to the Oregon-California border and on December 28th, 2011, Journey loped across the border into California, becoming the first confirmed wild wolf here in 87 years. Now, California is an enormous state. Where is he going to go? What scents does he smell on the air and where are those scents going to take him? Well, Journey ended up traveling throughout California through our seven northeasternmost counties for the next 15 months in Siskiyou and Lassen and Modoc and Shasta, Tehama, Plumas and Butte County. Day after day, week after week, month after month, following the scents on the air, searching, following this powerful innate drive, looking for a mate. There were some periods of time where journey stayed localized for a number of weeks 
Some of you may remember that back in the summer of 2012, there was an enormous wildfire, the Chips Fire around Lake Almanor in Plumas County. And he spent a fair amount of time there. And if you think about it, when there's a wildfire, other wildlife are fleeing from the wildfire, which means it was probably a great place for him to find deer, barbecue on the hoof or on wheels, whatever. It was a good spot for him to be. He knew what he was doing. He eventually returned to Oregon in the spring of 2013, but during the next year, he came back to California at least five times. Now he finally settled down in Southwest Oregon because he finally found a mate there. It was another wolf from Northeast Oregon who came all the way across the state. The two of them met up. They formed the Rogue Pack, named after the place they decided to call home, the Rogue Siskiyou National Forest. And they had litters of pups together for the next five years. Now, compared to other states, when Journey came into California, this state laid a welcome mat for wolves. Several documentaries were made about Journey, several books were written about him, and he made international news for sure. All in all, he traveled around 4,000 miles while he was traveling throughout the state. But this was just the beginning. So far, we have had two wolf packs established in California, and a third one may have just established. California's first wolf pack in at least 100 years, the Shasta pack, was confirmed in August of 2015. And this gorgeous pack of seven all-black wolves, the mom and dad and all five pups are these beautiful black furred animals, they were confirmed in, in Siskiyou County. And the thing is, that these wolves actually also came from Oregon too. Uh, they came from Northeast Oregon. We had a whole string of wolves initially coming from Northeast Oregon all the way across the state. It's almost like Journey was sending postcards back home saying, California's great, come visit. But there is a mystery about this pack. About two months after they were confirmed, a cow and a calf were found dead in their territory. It could not be determined what was the cause of death for the cow. The calf is believed to have probably been killed by the wolves. And shortly after that, the entire pack disappeared. About a year later, one of their offspring showed up in Nevada. Uh, he was uncollared, so we don't know where he is now. But the whole rest of the family, we don't know where they are either. California's second modern day pack, the Lassen Pack, was confirmed in the summer of 2017. Their territory is really huge. It's about 500 square miles. It crosses parts of both Plumas and Lassen County. And the breeding male of this pack is one of Journey's sons. Journey's first litter in 2014 had several pups, and one of them, when he got to be about a year and a half old, came into California, just like his dad had done. And he was very fortunate in that he met up with a female who had come here all the way from the Northern Rockies. She's related to wolves that were reintroduced into Wyoming. The two of them met up, and they formed the Lassen Pack, and they had pups three years in a row, 2017, 2018, and 2019. These photos are from the 2017 litter. About two months after the 2019 litter was born, the breeding male disappeared and we don't know what's become of him. But not too long after that, the female was seen with a new breeding male, uh, a black lone wolf that had been hanging out in the area. And so the two of them became mates. And the following year in 2020, they had pups together but he also bred with one of her two-year-old daughters. So they had pups together too, which means that in 2020, the Lassen Pack actually had two litters of pups at once. And just to show you how adorable this family is, I'm going to stop showing my PowerPoint for a moment. And Mila, if you could please show video one of the Lassen Pack family of wolves. There you go. So there's the mom. She's radio collared, although I think her collar's not working these days. And you can start to see the puppies come in from the 2019 litter. And then there's the adult teenage daughter. That may actually be the daughter that the new male breeds with the following year. 
and this is a trail camera video from uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I think this was taken in July, so the pups are about three months old here. You see they kind of lost their baby chubbiness and starting to get a little lanky. And in case you're wondering, they're eating poop, deer poop or elk poop. Yummo! I'll go back to sharing my screen. I'm sure whatever biologist, oops, I think you have to stop sharing in order for me to share. There we go. Okay. Let's go back. And we'll see what happens here. Okay, so I think whatever biologist captured that trail cam video must have been pretty ecstatic when they played that back and, and heard that wolf symphony. So California's latest wolf pack may have just formed. The whaleback pair is named after a mountainous area in the region where they are setting up a territory. And they are a new pair of wolves that have set up a territory in Siskiyou County, approximately near where the Shasta pack used to live. The male is a wolf from Oregon, and the female, we don't yet know where she's from. Uh, the two of them got together late last winter, early this winter, um, and if they breed and they've had pups, which if they're going to have pups, they would have had pups right about now, uh, then they will be called officially a pair. But these pairs and packs aren't the only wolves in California in recent years. Other wolves also have come to California. This is OR25, another, another gorgeous, can you, can you see my slides? Can you see my slides or you're only seeing no, me? No, 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 we're seeing, uh, we're seeing you, Amarok. I think you have to go to screen share. Okay, let's see what happened. Um, huh. Okay, let me go back, sorry about that. Little bit of trickiness, huh? Uh huh. Just a trifle. Okay. Okay, your screen. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we're going to go down. Shasta pack, Lassen pack, whale back pair. Okay, you can see it now? Yes. 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 Okay, so this is a new pair that I was just describing that lives in Siskiyou County, and they have a territory that's about as large as the Lassen Pack as well. The Whaleback Pair territory is also close to 500 square miles. Other wolves have come to or uh, California besides these pairs and families. So this is OR25. He is another gorgeous wolf, also originally from Northeast Oregon. He came to California in late 2015, stayed here for about six weeks, then returned to Oregon in early 2016. Tragically, about a year later, he was found illegally killed near Fort Klamath in Oregon. This is OR44, another wolf from Northeastern Oregon, and he came to California in the spring of 2018. His radio collar, you can see he's wearing one in that photo, but it stopped working shortly after he got here, so we don't know if he is still in the state. And here is a little heartbreak. This is OR59, and this picture was taken after he was uh, radio collared by the biologist in Oregon. So he's just kind of sleepy there, waking up from the tranquilizer from being radio collared. He came to California in late 2018, in, in uh, I think around the 5th or so of December of 2018, and only five days later, he was found illegally killed in Modoc County. His death is being investigated by the law enforcement branch of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. 
Several others of Journey's offspring have also come to California. We don't have a photo of her, but one of his daughters from his first 2014 litter also came to California in January of 2017. She's not wearing a radio collar, so we don't know if she's still in the state or not. And then in 2018, another of Journey's daughters, OR54, came into California. She stayed here for nearly two years, though during that time she made three sh short trips home to, to see the family, as it were, and then one overnight trip into Nevada. But she spent most of her time ranging across California through 10 different counties, and like her father, her travels were so extensive that she also captured international headlines. Over those uh, two years, she traveled through 10 different counties. She made it all the way down to the Tahoe Basin. She ended up covering more than 8,700 miles in that driving search, that seeking force looking for a mate, but was not successful. And then tragically, in February of 2020, she was found dead and her death is under investigation by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Law Enforcement Branch. This return of wolves to California is truly a wondrous story. When you think about it, 10 years ago, when Journey crossed the border into California, he became the first wolf here in 87 years. But realize he entered a state that was missing all of its wolves. It didn't used to be that way. Wolves were here before, and they were once widely distributed across California. Pre-European contact, Native people lived throughout California for 10,000 years, and the wolf exists in their creation stories, in their stories of their relationships with the natural world. The wolf exists in their artwork and their dance regalia and customs and beliefs, and the wolf exists in their languages. When Europeans arrived on what would become California, there were 80 different native languages spoken here. And of them, nearly everyone had a distinct word for wolf, fox, dog, and coyote. They knew the difference between these animals. They knew these animals. They knew the wolf. When Europeans arrived here, they also began to keep notes of what they saw. And so we have evidence of wolf presence throughout California also from the books and travel diaries and journals of explorers and settlers and gold miners and trappers and missionaries. So as you see on this map in the 1700s, as explorers landed along the coast, this is where wolves were first seen. But as those explorers became settlers and moved inland, the wolves on the coast were killed and then wolves were only seen in the central part of the state and so on as settlers moved more to the eastern edge of the state, the wolves in the central part were killed off and wolves were only seen in the eastern edge. If you think about it, the arrival of Europeans to California resulted in the same destruction as happened everywhere else that they landed, explored, and settled in the land that would become the United States. The native people were slaughtered, the wild elk and bison that the native people depended upon were slaughtered, and then the great majestic carnivores, the grizzly bears, the mountain lions, and the wolves also were slaughtered. California's last two known wolves were killed in San Bernardino County in 1922 and in Lassen County in 1924. And what is left of their remains is in a museum at the University of California at Berkeley. Now that you get the picture that wolves are animals that live by their feet, can travel long distances very quickly and can move very quickly from one place to another, let's talk about their role in nature. Why is it so important to have wolves on the landscape? No other species is more emblematic of wild nature than the wolf. Top predators like the wolf are the force that balances the whole system. The wolf's presence and natural hunting practice leads to healthier herds of deer and elk, and also to stronger populations of streamside plants and beavers and birds and fish and other wildlife. Wolves eat whatever large wild ungulate lives where the wolf lives. This might be bison or caribou or deer, elk or musk oxen or moose. This is what wolves evolved to eat. Without wolves, 
These large wild ungulates have no reason to be wary. They stand around and over browse on the vegetation. Having wolves back means these large wild ungulates are now on the move again, and that allows the vegetation to flourish. And having that vegetation back provides nesting sites for birds, building materials for beaver, and cool shade over creeks and ponds that juvenile fish and frogs need to thrive. Wolves also put food on the ground for other species. In Yellowstone National Park, every elk and deer and bison that's killed by wolves is then also visited and fed upon by all kinds of other wildlife, grizzly bears and coyotes and bobcats and mountain lions, foxes and eagles and bobcats and ravens, hundreds and hundreds of species of beetles. And the diseases that could devastate deer and elk herds, these are also kept in check by wolves because what wolves go after is the most vulnerable member of the herd, the sick, the old, the injured, the weak, the young. And wolves do this because it is placing themselves at the least risk possible too when they're hunting. They do this to make sure that they will be able to return home safely to their own families because actually hunting is quite dangerous for wolves. Think about it. You've got a 110 pound animal trying to take down a 800 pound elk or a 2200 pound bison. Wolves get kicked in the head, they get broken ribs, uh, punctured lungs, fractured skulls. They come home empty handed or they don't come home at all. This would be like you or I going to the grocery store and nine out of 10 times coming home beat up with no groceries. Now try explaining that to your pups. While hunting is dangerous for wolves, the real threat for wolves, we all know, is humans, and we'll get to that shortly. So what's usually not on the menu? Despite what headlines in wolf country would imply, wolf cause losses of livestock are just a fraction of a percent of all the losses of death and injury due to livestock. Ranchers and farmers every year report to the U.S. Department of Agriculture what are their losses and what are the causes of losses. And then the U.S. Department of Agriculture every few years puts out a report through the National Agricultural Statistics Service. And what that report tells us is that the vast majority of losses, about 95% of cattle and calf losses, and about 60% of sheep and lamb losses, are due to causes that have nothing to do with any predator of any kind. Instead, most livestock losses are due to things like disease, dehydration, starvation, birthing complications, respiratory infection, and ingestion of poisonous weeds. Of the remaining percent of livestock that are lost due to predators, wolves are at the bottom of the list, way behind coyotes, domestic dogs, cougars, bears, bobcats, and eagles. In the parts of the country where wolves are returning, Livestock owners who are willing to coexist with wolves are using a whole range of tools and strategies to be proactive, to prevent the rare conflicts that can take place with wolves. And these include things like hauling away carcasses of livestock that have died from other causes. This is one of the top actions to take because a rotting carcass is going to draw not only wolves, but all kinds of other predators and bring them right to your ranch where your live livestock is. The second most important thing is increased human presence. So checking on your cattle, sheep, and regular and sh cattle and sheep regularly can help scare wolves away. It also allows you to see if you have injured or sick livestock that you should pull off the grazing allotment or grazing pasture so they don't draw in predators. On large grazing allotments, having people riding around on horseback, they're called range riders, to monitor the cattle can be really helpful to keep them bunched up and observable. And for sheep, using human shepherds accompanied by livestock guarding dogs, like this dog in the right-hand photo here. These have been used for centuries in Europe where they haven't completely wiped out their wolves. And so they've been used to living with wolves and having livestock guarding dogs. If your livestock's in a fenced pasture, there's a couple of tools you could use. And one of them is shown in this lower left corner. That red flagging that's hanging on the fence line is called flattery and it is a psychological barrier. Wolves don't like to cross under that waving stuff. It looks pretty scary to them, and it's good for about two months, and sometimes that's all you need, just like during calving or lambing season, just that 
two months of protection. But if you want to be sure that the wolf won't get under it if it gets desensitized, then you put that flattery on an electric fence. And then we call it turbo flattery. So if the wolf tries to go under, it'll get zapped by the electric fence. There's a lot more methods that are always being developed and tried out. But the main thing to remember is that we do know from scientific research that using these proactive, non-lethal conflict prevention methods in advance is much more effective than simply killing wolves after the fact and hoping you won't have more problems. Let's talk about wolf biology and behavior. So we all know the term a pack, but what is a pack? It's a family. It's a mother and father wolf. It's their puppies from this year's litter, some teenage pups from last year's litter, and maybe some even older sub-adult teenagers from the year before. And there might be some brothers and sisters of the mother and father wolf that are also part of that pack. Unlike dogs, wolves only mate once a year, and it's right around Valentine's Day. And then they have puppies about two months later, right around tax day. And it's generally only the pack's two lead male and female animals that will breed. Before the mother gives birth, she will dig a den. And a den can take a couple of different forms. It might be a tunnel in the ground. Uh, it could be in some hollowed out logs. Or if it's in a part of the world where the ground is too frozen to dig into, it might just be a rock outcropping, like these pups up here on the right in the Arctic. When they are born, wolf pups weigh about a pound at birth. Their eyes open at 14 days, and their eyes are this milky blue color when they're first born, but they quickly change to golden green or golden brown. Adult wolves do not have blue eyes. They give their first howls at around three weeks of age, but they can't hear themselves. Their ears aren't even working yet. And then they are nursed by their mother until they're about five weeks of age when she starts to wean them. And about nine weeks of age, the pups should be fully weaned. And at which point they start eating regurgitated food that the adult wolves bring back when they've been hunting. So literally when the mom and dad will come back from a hunt, the puppies will greet them, they'll lick at their face, they'll bite at their lips. And that causes this automatic response of the adult wolves to barf up the 10, 20 pounds of elk or deer that, that they just ate. And so for any of you who have dogs, um, I'm sure many of you have had this experience of coming home and your dog excitedly greets you, it licks you on your face, and dogs are really closely related to wolves. This is ancestral wolf behavior. So yeah, your, your dog is happy to see you, but what she's really hoping for is that you will barf up your lunch for her. Wolves love puppies. All the wolves in a pack are involved in taking care of those puppies, and so in fact, when the adults go off hunting, they usually leave behind a teenage wolf to act as a babysitter for the pups. When the pups get to be around seven months old, finally at that time, they're big enough and strong enough and fast enough to keep up with the adults. And then they will join the family on a hunt. And that's how they learn to hunt. They learn hunting techniques. They learn where the places are good for hunting. Wolves have culture and they teach their pups these things. If wolves are not killed by humans, through state hunting and trapping seasons, for instance, then a wolf pack will evolve into a multi-generation family unit, much like family units. Each of them has a different role, they each have different skills, and together they help the family unit to thrive. Wolves communicate through a whole range of means. And even though we associate wolves with howling, they also will bark, especially if they're alarmed. If you happen to stumble across a, a, a wolf den site or near a rendezvous site, which is where wolves move their pups when they're a little bit older, that will alarm the wolves and they'll be scared and they'll want you to leave and they will make a bark howling sound that is a very surprising sound. They just want you to leave them alone. But wolves do howl. They howl to find each other. They howl in celebration when they're back together again. Wolves also howl in mourning when a pack mate dies. Wolves use body language to communicate. So the wolves in these photos that are upright, their ears are a little more forward. And uh, if the picture had shown their tails, you would see if their tails are up as well. These are the more dominant animals in the wolf family. The wolves that are groveling with their tail between their legs, licking the face of the other adults as if they were puppies. These are the more subordinate animals. 
And then wolves also communicate through facial expressions. And their expressions are expressions we can relate to. Uh, every time I see this picture, it reminds me of when my husband and I go out to dinner and we each order a nice salad and he tries to steal an olive off of my salad plate. Another very important means of communication for wolves, really important means, is through scent. So wolves will roll in smelly things like dead things. And we don't really know for sure why they do it. It may be to cover their own scent while they're hunting. It may be so that they can go back to their pack and be wearing their menu on their coat saying, hey, I found something really good and dead and smelly, let's go eat it. Um, but wolves also mark their own scent as they're traveling and they mark it with their own urine. And they're doing this to mark the boundaries of their own territory, to warn other wolves away, but they also do this as a way of finding other wolves. And so here's a really great example of this. Earlier when I talked about all the traveling that Journey did when he was in California. So this map is the northeasternmost counties of California. All of these lines are places that he traveled. The different colored segments show different series of months that he was traveling in that area. And you can see there's this constant looping back and looping back. So everywhere he went, he would stop and raise his leg and mark his trail with his own urine scent. And then days, weeks, or months later, he would loop back and he would check those spots. And what he was looking for was to see if another wolf had scent marked over where he had scent marked. It, it's female. So why should we care about wolves? Well, for all of the reasons that I just described, their majesty and grace and their charismatic spirit, their strong family bonds, and their essential role in wild nature. And these are the reasons why people care so much about wolves. And these are also the reasons why there have to be protections in place so that wolves can return to their rightful place on the landscape. And that's only going to happen if there are laws to protect them and if the public stays involved to make sure that the laws are enforced. Let's step back and take a look at our overall West Coast wolf population. So on this map, you can see on the uh, far left side of the map, that's Washington at the top of the screen going down to Oregon and then California. Every place on the map that's marked in green are places that scientists have identified as having suitable wolf habitat. Where it's marked in brown is where wolves are currently occupying. And then the brown hatched areas are where wolves are starting to maybe set up territory. And I see we need to update this map just a little bit in California. We're going to need to add a new brown blotch just above the one that's there to show the new territory of the whaleback pair. So what's the over wolf population in these states? Well, every spring, Oregon and Washington, their state wildlife agencies issue an annual wolf report. And it gives the numbers of their wolf population as of December from the previous year. Well, both of those agencies are due to give their 2020 wolf report next week at their commission meetings. So the numbers I'm going to give you are from the year before. So as of the end of 2019 in Washington, there were confirmed 108 wolves. In Oregon, it confirmed 158 wolves. And in California, fewer than a dozen. After wolves were protected federally under the Federal Endangered Species Act in 1974, an agency called the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was then required to develop recovery plans for wolves. But instead of developing recovery plans nationwide, the agency only developed recovery plans for wolves in three areas, in the Midwestern United States, in a part we call the Western Great Lakes states, that's Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin, then in the northern Rocky states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, and in the southwestern states of Arizona and New Mexico. There were already a few hundred wolves in the Midwest, because that's the only place there were still any wolves left by the time the Endangered Species Act was passed. So no wolves had to be reintroduced there, but the protections allowed the population there to grow. But wolves did have to be reintroduced into the northern Rocky Mountains in Idaho and Yellowstone and they were also reintroduced in the Southwest. The West Coast was not part of any of these recovery plans. Wolves were never reintroduced here. They've all come in here on their own. The wolves that have come into Washington have walked there from Idaho 
and then also south from British Columbia. The wolves from Oregon have walked in there from Idaho. And then almost all of California's wolves are coming from Oregon. And this dispersing wolf behavior, this is completely normal. When wolves get to be teenagers, when they're about one and a half to three years old, it's really a typical time for them to leave their family and go off looking for mates and territory of their own. And while much of California celebrated when wolves started coming into the state, not everybody was pleased. So these are public statements that were made by elected supervisors from three different Northern California counties when Journey came to our state. And these kinds of statements made it very clear to my organization and others that wolves were going to need protections in California because statements like this could cause other people to decide to go out and harm wolves. At the time, wolves were still federally protected throughout most of the lower 48 United States. The federal government had tried so many times to strip wolves of Federal Endangered Species Act protections, we knew that they could do it again at any time. So in 2012, my organization and three other groups petitioned the state of California to protect wolves under California State Endangered Species Act. This was a two-year process. It involved a lot of public meetings and hearings and rallies. And maybe some of you who are listening to this talk today attended those hearings and spoke up for wolves. And in the end, it was a successful effort. Wolves in California are now fully protected under the State Endangered Species Act. It is illegal to kill a wolf in California except in defense of human life. And it's so important that wolves have state protections here because in January of this year, early January, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service removed federal protections from wolves under the Endangered Species Act throughout almost the entire country. My organization and other groups are challenging this action in court, but in the meantime, thank goodness wolves are fully protected under state law here. In addition to these state protections, California also wrote a state wolf conservation plan I had the good fortune to be one of the stakeholders that helped advise the agency with recommendations and perspectives on what should be in this plan. And one of the things that's included in that plan is a state wolf map. And this is a map of where there's believed to be good habitat for wolves. You'll see on this map that everywhere that's marked dark gray is deemed good wolf habitat. And one of the things that has been so thrilling to see is that the wolves have dispersed into California have traveled through most of the exact places shown on this map, including even OR93, because after he traveled all the way almost down to the tip of that long strip of gray on the eastern side, once he came across the Central Valley, he was headed over to another spot on that map, as you can see, near Los Padres National Forest, which is also deemed good habitat. So that's been really fun to see. But one of the other things that's really intriguing to think about is this. To make a map like this, what scientists do is they overlay different types of maps on top of each other. So they take a map of forested habitat, and then they take a map of road density, and then they take a map of prey availability, and they lay these over each other. And where they find places where there's lots of forest and where there's prey availability and where the road density is fairly low, this is good wolf habitat. Well, wolves don't have these maps. They don't do map modeling. They find these places just by their instinct. So really, where the wolves are going now, they're ground truthing what the scientists did when they came up with these maps and published them. So what I've just described is California and the West Coast and how things are going here. There's another movie out there, and it's more like a Stephen King film. There are monsters out there and they are gunning for wolves. In this country, no other wildlife, no other wildlife species has been more persecuted or more in need of social justice than the wolf. This was true 400 years ago. It's still true today. When Europeans arrived in North America, an estimated 2 million wolves roamed across the entire continent. So on this map, every place that's dark green and light green and stippled and crosshatch, this is where wolves once lived. Today, they only live in the dark green areas. It is estimated that in the Western United States and Mexico alone, there were 380,000 wolves, 
380,000 wolves just in the West. Over a 400 year period, wolves were relentlessly persecuted. They were trapped and shot and snared and poisoned and worse. And by the 1930s, the wolf population of the lower 48 had been almost entirely eliminated. Fast forward several decades. In the 1960s and 1970s, America underwent some really profound transformations in our social and political and environmental consciousness. And it was during this time that we passed some of the most profound, significant, protective environmental laws in the world, including in 1973, the Endangered Species Act. And in 1974, wolves were protected under the act. But as I mentioned earlier, the federal government worked to restore wolves only in three places, the Western Great Lakes, the Northern Rockies, and in the Southwest. Today, there are about 6,500, 7,000 maybe wolves in the lower 48 United States. This is 1% of the wolf's original numbers, living in only around 10% of their historic range. And no scientist would consider such low numbers in such a small geographic area to be a safely recovered species. Why do we not have full wolf recovery in the US? The same forces that sought to eradicate wolves in the first place still exist. And because of the political pressure by the livestock industry, the sports hunting industry, the anti-government factions, and all the politicians and lobbyists who represent them, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has no intention of doing any more wolf recovery anywhere else. And in fact, this agency has tried to strip protections of wolves nearly a dozen times over the last 20 years. And wherever wolves have lost federal protections and did not have state protections in place, those states immediately instituted very aggressive hunting and trapping seasons designed to bring their wolf numbers down to bare bones. Since 2011, in places where wolves have lost federal protections, more than 7,000 wolves have been killed in state-sanctioned hunting and trapping seasons. States like Montana and Idaho just passed new laws and regulations to expand wolf killing there even further. Longer hunting seasons, using more brutal ways to kill wolves, paying bounties to people to kill wolves. Wisconsin just held a wolf hunt in February. In only two and a half days time, they killed at least 20% of their entire state wolf population. To ensure that California's wolf recovery never devolves into that Stephen King kind of nightmare movie, three things are necessary. Public support, legal protections, and constant vigilance by the public. The public support definitely exists. Surveys show that there is overwhelming support for wolf recovery and protections in California and the other two West Coast states. As for legal protections, wolves in California are completely protected under state law. And if we prevail in court, we'll get federal protections back for them as well. And as far as constant public vigilance, this is where you come in so that decision makers in the state legislature and at the wildlife agency and at the state fish and game commission know how the public feels that you want wolves in California, that you view them as part of your natural wildlife heritage, that you understand how essential they are for healthy ecosystems and that you want them protected here. I'm going to show you four different links that you can go to after this webinar or anytime to see what actions that you can take right now and where you can find more information on wolf recovery in the US. So this first one is at bit.ly slash wolf petition. This is a petition that we are sending to all the different governors across the country to alert them. And that we've been sending these for some time now to alert them that wolves have had federal protection stripped and that they need to ensure that their own state protects wolves. This one at bit.ly slash state wolf toolkit. It's an activist toolkit that gives you even more information on how to contact various governors, legislators, commissions, and some talking points about what you should say to them if you write or call or email them. 
This one, bit.ly slash reinstate wolf protections. This is a letter we put together that we're submitting to the Biden administration. It will go to President Biden. It will go to Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service Director. We're requesting that they review this rule that was actually put into place by the Trump administration and then went into effect January 4th before President Biden took office and asking them to review this rule, note that it's completely scientifically unsupportable and that is illegal. It violates the Endangered Species Act and asking them to reverse this decision. This last site, bit.ly slash center wolf campaign is a place that you can go to that has additional information about wolf recovery efforts and the battles to protect wolves in different parts of the country. The thing is, if wolves are sufficiently perfect, protected, they will create their own future. And to see what I mean, we're going to go to Yellowstone one last time. Mila, if you could please play the second video. Stop sharing my screen. A hardy flock of waxwings has been feeding on juniper berries all winter, and in Yellowstone, that's six months long. Yet with two months of winter still to go, a hint of spring is in the air. A lone black wolf is coming to call on the druids. He's not just any wolf. He is 302, the most notorious flirt in Yellowstone. He comes from a clan almost 20 miles away, but all the druids know him well. This is the second year he has approached the pack. Twenty-one and his mate are not exactly pleased to see him. Their daughter, however, can hardly contain herself. one eye on the daughter and one on the old man. Finally, 21 has had enough. 302 beats a hasty retreat. He's more of a Casanova, a lover, not a fighter. He wants no part of challenging the old chief. The daughter slinks home to her mother. But this is a battle parents never win. Their daughter's longing is beyond their control. This is the mating season, and not just for wolves. Okay, so I'm going to try to share my screen again. And, and I don't know where I went. <laughs> Is my picture still there? Oh, only my oh, picture's there. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let me let me fix this again. All right. So let me try. Let's see. Go here. Let me share my screen. Try this. There you go. Uh, and oh, 
works. And let me see if I can get my face back here. Oops, that's you. Oh, is my face showing? Yes, yes. All righty. On, well, on the side, on the side. Okay. You have, you have, that's, you have, that's, you have the PowerPoint on on the last image, I believe. Got it. So, um, just an acknowledgement here for some of the lovely photos and videos. And a huge thank you to the Friends of San Pedro Valley Park for inviting me back to speak. I was so excited when Mila contacted me in January. We had no idea that um, OR93 would be coming into the state to really add for the excitement and how timely this would be. But um, next week is Earth Day, and I can't think of a better way to celebrate this beautiful planet and this beautiful wolf's arrival in our state and then by spending this afternoon with all of you so that you can learn more about wolves, how to get involved and how to welcome them back to California. And so with that, uh, I think we're ready for question and answer. And I think I just need to figure out either how to pull up the questions or you can read them Mila, either, either way. Uh, I'll have a look and see what we have. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, John is asking, is OR93 back in San Benito then? He is, right? Well, we don't know. So here's the thing. Radio <laughs> collars don't work all of the time. Um, radio collars have batteries that can die. And then depending upon where the wolf is, the terrain can interfere or uh, bad weather can interfere with the satellite up in the sky being able to actually get the signal from the radio collar. So when I spoke with the CDFW wolf biologist yesterday, he indicated that the last signal that they had gotten from OR93 was a week ago last Monday. So that's like, uh, I don't know, the 5th or 7th of April. And at that time he was in San Luis Obispo County. So uh, if he is back in San Benito, we certainly don't know that. Um, don't know where he is right at the moment. Uh, and well, most most of the wolves, or a lot of them, have collars. Do they ever become? Sherry is asking whether they ever become too small for the wolf. So, um, first of all, most of the wolves don't have collars. Only a few wolves may have collars. Agencies <laughs> in different states try to get at least one animal in a pack collared, and sometimes they try to get maybe two animals in the pack collared. Uh, catching wolves to radio call them and is, it, radio collar them is not an easy feat. Um, just the act of trying to go out and get them can actually scare them off. And so you may spend a year trying to capture a wolf to radio collar it unsuccessfully. In terms of whether or not they ever get too small for the wolf, so in the cases of younger wolves, I wouldn't call them puppies, but kind of between puppies and uh, teenagers, what biologists will do is that they will put a collar on that's bigger and then they fit it with like styrofoam with inside of the collar. So the styrofoam gradually uh, disintegrates as the pup gets bigger and then the collar will fit it. Some of the collars are designed also so that they will drop off after a certain period of time, like maybe after a year and a half. Um, it really varies as to what the agencies decide to do, what kind of collar they're going to use. And sometimes other members of the pack will help remove a collar by chewing it off. Oh, okay. Um, so here, um Um, Savannah is saying that we're focusing on the West Coast wolves, um, but the recent wolf hunt in Wisconsin, would you be able to address that? Hunters went over the legal limit and killed 216 gray wolves. I have seen yeah. articles um, online. Well, uh, as conservation, what is your take on the situation in Wisconsin? So the situation in Wisconsin is exactly what we predicted, exactly what we feared when we've been saying all along that wolves should not be removed from the Federal Endangered Species Act because most states are not at all equipped to responsibly manage their wolf populations. 
They're subject to way too many political pressures from all of the forces I talked about. They ignore the science that shows that wolves do not need to be hunted. They, they self-regulate their own populations, either by territorial disputes or according to what the prey density is. So wolves do not need to be hunted. And scientists the globe over are saying, we need to protect our apex predators everywhere because we're losing them at such a drastic pace. Wisconsin was a situation where uh, like all of those political pressures, if you put them all together and shook them up, it, it, it was all like one big time bomb waiting to happen. So Wisconsin wolves had been federally delisted there back in 2012 through 2014, and they had hunting and trapping seasons then, uh, so did their neighboring two states, and lawsuits got federal protections restored for them. But in the meantime, uh, those who wanted to ensure there'd be wolf hunts again got a law passed that said, once wolves are federally delisted again, there will be a wolf hunt. State law mandated it. And the state law said that the wolf hunt would start in November and go through the end of February. The state law also said that hunters could use dogs to hunt wolves. And it also said that once the agency gave notice that a particular hunting unit would be closed, they still had to leave it open another 24 hours before they could close it. This is just a disastrous set of circumstances. When wolves were federally delisted in early January, uh, a group of legislators, a group of Republican legislators in Wisconsin went to the, uh, so in, in California, we call our state agency, the Department of Fish and Wildlife. In uh, Wisconsin, it's called the Department of Natural Resources. In California, the body that oversees the state wildlife agency is Cal the California Fish and Game Commission. In Wisconsin, the body that oversees their Department of Natural Resources is called the Board of Natural Resources. So the legislature, legislators went to the board of the DNR and insisted that there be a wolf hunt. The DNR held a public hearing. Many of us testified, many of us submitted written comments. One of the other things the state is supposed to do is uh, the tribes in that area do not believe in hunting wolves. They view the wolf literally as their brother. They have a huge cultural uh, uh, connection with wolves in that area. And there are tre treaty rights. They, the, State government is supposed to consult with the tribes under tribal treaty rights before they can do anything like open a wolf hunt. The um, testimony at the hearing was that the, their own agency didn't want to do a wolf hunt yet. They were still doing their wolf population count. They hadn't done their tribal treaty consultation yet. They were updating their wolf plan. And if you did a hunt right then, it would really mess up the wolf population. Plus it was going right into the season when wolves would be getting pregnant. So you'd be killing pregnant wolves as well, something that had never been done before in Wisconsin. The DNR board voted not to hold the wolf hunt. They were convinced by the tribal treaty argument. I think they were afraid of getting sued. But right after that, an out-of-state hunting group filed a lawsuit and forced the wolf hunt to proceed. The lower court judge ruled in favor of the hunter group the appellate court, uh, for legal reasons I won't go into here, it's too complicated, uh, didn't have jurisdiction and couldn't do anything about what the lower court did. And so the hunt proceeded. The agency put together a quota over like a three-day weekend of uh, 200 wolves. They agreed to give, I think, 81 of those wolves to the tribe, knowing that the, wolf, the tribe would not hunt them. They opened up a, a lottery for people to apply for licenses. And many of us, including myself, applied to get a license so that we could hopefully get a, a tag, I should say, so that we could prevent other people from actually hunting the wolves. But it didn't matter. So many tags were sold. And because they were hunting with dogs and there was a fresh snow, it was so easy for them to find the wolves. Hunters were going out with packs of dogs in truck after truck after truck, like a caravan, and just setting them loose after each other and killed, uh, ended up killing 216 wolves, which ended up being 81% over the quota that was supposed to be allotted for the non-tribal people. So it was an absolute uh, 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 poster child example of, of why wolves cannot be managed by the states at this point, because the states are under, under too much political pressure to ignore the science and, and violate the law. 
Um, so there are a number of groups that are strategizing on what we're going to do to try to stop them from having another hunt starting in November. I will tell you right now that starting April 15th and going through May 15th, there is a comment opportunity for the public to comment not only on whether or not you want a wolf hunt to take place in November, but also wolf management over the next 10 years. I understand the survey that the agency has put forward is really confusing. And so uh, we're sorting through it to figure out the best way of how to advise people how to answer that survey so that you're, you're not giving them an answer that you don't want to give them. And I think that we will have an alert coming out maybe in two weeks from now. So you might want to stay tuned for that where we give you some advice on how to deal with that survey. There's another great group in Wisconsin called Friends of the Wisconsin Wolf and Wildlife. It is also working really hard on the situation and they're doing the same thing. So uh, take a look at our website to see our alerts. Take a look at their website to see their alerts coming up on that. Uh, thank you, Arab. Let, let's head back to California for a while. There are um, quite a few folks are asking uh, with uh, asking questions in regards to OR93. And um, if he doesn't find, is there any possibility of relocating him or um, do you think he may just be able to find a mate if he meanders back up north and safely? Um, yeah, I wish, I wish when he came knocking at my door, I would be able to say, yeah, we've got a girlfriend for you right here. Uh, I don't think that's the case. You know, uh, it, it's so remarkable that he made it where he has. And it's definitely true that wolves could be in places that we don't know about. He, we know where he is because he has a radio collar. So we're, we're, we're able to know where he is as long as his radio collar is working or transmitting. And there could be wolves in other places. Um, I very much doubt, and the wolf biologist from CDFW also very much doubts that there is another wolf wandering around on the coast where he's wandering right now. A number of people have asked, you know, is he going to be captured and relocated? And here's the thing, it, capturing a wolf has a lot of risk to the wolf and to the humans involved. So one of the ways that would be gone about to try to capture a wolf to uh, relocate him would be to use helicopters and then you would tranquilize dart the animal from the helicopter. So first of all, CDF and W doesn't have people out doing helicopter wolf work. I mean, this is not like the Northern Rockies where they've had wolves for 25 years now since the reintroduction and that they've had a lot of helicopters out there doing work for trapping and radio collaring and tranquilized darting. So we don't have that capacity here. Anyone who got, does go up in a helicopter to do that kind of work has to know the terrain really well. It's dangerous. There are helicopter crashes that happen in unfamiliar terrain. So it's dangerous for the humans. For the wolf, if you think about it, you're chasing an animal with a helicopter. It's, it's frightening. Um, it's anxiety causing. Uh, animals all the time when they are captured for wildlife study are subject to something called capture myopathy which is a really rapid, rapid tissue degeneration that happens simply because the animal's kind of in shock from the stress. And so it's an operation that has to be taken very carefully, very thoughtfully, very calmly, with as little risk to the animal as possible. So you have all of those issues to consider. On top of that, the next question is, where would you put him? Would you take him back to Oregon? Would you take him back to Northern California? And no matter where you take him, there's absolutely no assurance that he would stay there. In fact, I would just about guarantee that he won't stay there, that he'll go on the move again. He may try to come all the way back down here again. So, well, it uh, feels awful to think about him out there roaming around by himself, not finding a companion and worrying about him getting hit by a car or worse, you know, some human who doesn't like wolves wanting to go after him. Um, trying to do something, on the other hand, is fraught with just as many complications and fears. So for now, the agency is not planning to try to capture him and relocate him. Um, they're constantly 
evaluating their decision on that. But for now, there's not plans to do that. Yeah. Is, is there um, a possibility of your moving the slides somewhat um, in reverse so that we could see uh, the various uh, websites that you had posted uh, at the, towards the end of your talk? I'm going to try to do that right now. My arrow cursor has not been my friend this week, but we're going to try. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's not doing it. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to share again. Try it again. Oh, thank you. Carol Drake is putting them all up into the uh, chat room there. And Jess Rayborn did as well. Okay. Does that help everybody that they're now in the chat? Let's see. Uh, let's see, center. Oh, there's two of them there. Well, there's, there's two of them <laughs> there, and, um, and then there's the one where... Okay. I'm going to go back here because my cursor seems to be working now. Uh, okay, so here's the first one. And this is a petition that's going to the various governors. I'll wait a moment while people write that down. Okay. And then here's the second one. This is the Activist State Wolf Toolkit. State Toolkit. And here's the third one. This is a petition that's going to go to uh, the Biden administration. And this final one is on our web page to learn more about wolf recovery efforts and efforts to protect wolves. Thank you, Amara. Um, so the, you, uh, the, the letter that was going out to the US Fish and Wildlife with regards to um, protecting and, and getting protection for the wolves in the lower 48, which had been rescinded in 2020, about in late October. Is there any headway in that direction? So initially when the Biden administration got into office, our organization and other conservation organizations wrote to the administration and provided them with a huge list of different rules or regulations, as they're called, that had been enacted under the Trump administration that we were asking the new Biden administration to review in light of the fact that those prior rules uh, completely ignored science or violated the law or both. Shortly after making that request, uh, President Biden did issue a directive to multiple agencies and listed many rules requesting they be reviewed. And one of them was this delisting rule. The US Fish and Wildlife Service said that they reviewed the rule and that they were standing by their decision. This is a new request asking them to go back and do it again because prior to now, the Secretary of the Department of Interior, Deb Holland, was not yet installed into her cabinet position. And we think she may have a stronger voice in directing her agencies to take a deeper look. This is one of those rules that because it was announced in November and became effective January 4th, it is not the kind of rule that the Biden administration could just automatically reverse on its own. If the rule had not yet become effective when he took office, they would have been able to simply reverse it. At this point, what they have to do is review it and decide how they're going to address it. Right now, there are three lawsuits filed against the government for this delisting. Uh, two of the lawsuits are of multiple coalitions. We're in a coalition of groups represented by Earth Justice. There's another lawsuit filed by Western Environmental Law Center, which is another coalition. And then there's a lawsuit by NRDC. All of those lawsuits have been consolidated. They're in the Northern District of California in a federal court in Oakland. 
So one of the other options is for the Biden administration and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to cut their losses and decide um, that we have made correct legal arguments and correct science arguments and that they should enter into settlement negotiations with the groups that are suing. And under settlement negotiations, it would be entirely possible to get the rule withdrawn. But we're very early in those court cases. The uh, judge has not yet even set a briefing schedule on them. And so we don't expect to have an answer or a decision before this fall's hunting seasons that will be coming up in a number of states. So we will continue to be having to battle things out at the state level at some of the states until this federal rule issue gets um, resolved. Mm. Mm. Definitely. Well, patience and, and uh, keeping our fingers crossed is necessary, I think. Um, and in the fight, yep. Yeah. Um, with regards to wolves, I mean, they, they're, they never, well, I, do they attack human beings? So you would be more likely to have a candy machine fall over on you from pulling the handle too hard when it ate your money and didn't give you your candy bar back than you would of having being, uh, being attacked by a wolf. In the last 110 years of all the records that have been kept, there in all of North America, including Alaska where there's about 7,000 wolves and Canada where there's between 40 and 60,000 wolves. In all of North America in the last 110 years, there have only been two instances of wolves killing a person, one in Canada and one in Alaska. And the one in Canada was even under dispute by the experts as to whether it was a wolf that killed the person or was it a bear that killed the person and then the wolves scavenged on the body. Mm. Um, wolves are so fearful of humans, they don't want to have anything to do with us. Uh, if they see, smell, or hear you before you see them, they will be gone before you see them. And if you do happen to see a wolf and it's looking at you, it's probably a younger wolf, a teenage wolf, who just doesn't know any better than to not just stand there and they ought to just run off. Um, wolves are very fearful of humans. They don't view us as prey animals. Remember, they evolve to eat prey animals that have four legs and hoofs and run. Um, and, and we don't make that definition. So, no, you're, you're, you're so much more likely, you know, in Canada, as I said, they've got, you know, 50, 50,000 wolves. The most dangerous animal in Canada is the horse and the moose. Those two animals are responsible for the most deaths of humans of any animals in Canada. So um, here in the U.S., the Center for Disease Control actually keeps statistics on um, deaths of humans caused by animals. Every year in the U.S., approximately 20 to 22 people are killed by dogs. Approximately 20 to 28 people are killed by livestock. Uh, 200 people a year are killed in car crashes from deer. So you're pretty safe around a wolf. Wolves don't like dogs much. Wolves view dogs as territorial competitors. They think it's another wolf or a coyote. So if you're hiking in wolf territory, it makes sense for you to keep your dog on leash or keep your dog, make sure your dog is under voice control or keep your dog at home. And you know, it's just because wolves think your dog's another wolf. Mm. And with the number of wolves that we had before um, Europeans came over, there was, you mentioned a huge number of over 300,000 wolves that existed we probably can never get back to that number. Uh, we don't have the habitat for, for them. But um, also going back in history, uh, we, had, we had the grizzly bear, we had the wolves, we had major, you know, we have, the, we have the mountain lion now, we have other apex predators. How does the wolf fit into, into that chain? Uh, in terms of uh, prey versus predator? Do yeah, that's a really great question. There, there are many state agencies that are doing predator-prey studies to understand 
the dynamic between having wolves and cougars and grizzlies on the landscape. Um, what effect does that have on the prey? Uh, which of those predators are more likely to be taking more prey than the others? And so um, it's a question that a lot of scientists love, and, and I love this question as well. You know, they, they all existed together and they do have different roles. So for instance, um, wolves are largely carnivores. They will eat berries and things on occasion, but they're largely carnivores. Grizzly bears, they're omnivores. So they take a lot more elk calves than wolves do. They, they take a lot of elk calves, but they also eat berries. And one of the things that they've seen in the Yellowstone areas with having wolves back, remember I talked earlier about that phenomenon of keeping wild ungulates on the move and allows the vegetation to come back. Well, some of the vegetation that's come back isn't just those willows and aspens along the creeks, it's berry bushes. So having wolves back is providing more food for grizzly bears. Like, and who would have ever thought of that? Um, the interaction between wolves and cougars is fascinating as well. Uh, in a number of places, uh, wolves have scared cougars off of their kill. And so then cougars have to go out and kill another elk. And on the other hand, there are some places, including in Washington, where cougars have killed wolves. So they definitely have an interaction with each other. If you think about, to the different way that they hunt. So wolves are what we call coursing predators. And this is what I talked about earlier, how they look for the most vulnerable. And they do that by chasing their prey. That's how out of that herd of 150 elk, they can spot one elk that's got arthritis in its hoof that you and I can't see when you're looking at that elk, but the wolves can see it. Uh, they also can detect other weaknesses. So for instance, there's a disease in wild ungulates that is going across the country called chronic wasting disease. It's like the deer and elk version of mad cow disease. It's a brain prion disease. And because wolves can detect when an animal is just acting kind of sickly by when they're chasing it, the animal isn't acting normally, scientists believe that wolves, probably even better than cougars, are going to be able to determine whether or not an elk or deer has chronic wasting disease and therefore call out that member of the herd. Mountain lions are not horsing predators. They're what, what are called stalking predators. You know, they basically find their prey and then they pounce on it from above, maybe from a tree or from a rock. So they don't have to wait to see if an animal is particularly vulnerable. So they're actually eating different members of the herd than wolves would. You know, they, they all fill their role. They all have a very unique role and it's all evolved over thousands of years. And you know, the person that started asking out the question, yeah, you're right, we're never gonna have 300,000 wolves back. We're, we're not. I mean, wolves are habitat generalists. They don't need particular habitat. We lost wolves not because we destroyed their habitat. We lost wolves because we killed them. Mm -hmm. Wolves will live just about any place that people will tolerate them. But even so, wolves still need to have a place where there is wild prey. And as we lose those forested areas, we lose places for wild prey. So we will never have 300,000 wolves back again, uh, unless humans are gone someday, maybe. Um, but, you know, good grief, you know, we have plenty of wolf habitat in this country where we could easily have twice as many wolves as we still have. We did a study back in 2014 where we put together all of those habitat modeling studies that scientists had done so far throughout the lower 48. And we put together 27 different studies. And we determined that just from those studies alone, and there's still more work to be done, there's 530,000 square miles of suitable habitat for wolves in this country. And right now, wolves are only occupying about a third of that. So there's still plenty of good places for wolves. So we could have two times, three times the amount of wolves we have now, and they would do just fine. Mm. Let me just quickly check um, something that's popped up. Uh, from, 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 oh. 
there's something about oh okay i think this is it this is between panelists okay um let me just so um, and and how well, I suppose we'll finish with one last question and ask about Canada, where uh, the the wolves were initially captured for reintroduction at Yellowstone. How are the uh, is there any protection for them in in Canada? There is very little protection for wolves in Canada. I had people ask me this before. Um, uh, somebody the other day asked me, you know, shouldn't we have just left those wolves in Canada? Uh, they would have been safer than coming down here to the United States. But the fact is that the area where those wolves were captured uh, in, in uh, Alberta and um, Jasper, uh, these are areas where there are not wolf protections. And had those wolves been left there and trapped by the wolf people that normally trap wolves there, they trap those wolves to kill them. And those wolves could have easily ended up being a fur coat lining on the hood of a jacket. So uh, I can't say that they're any safer there. And if people have been following the situation in other parts of Canada, for instance, uh, further west on the coastal area in the Tongass National Forest, uh, actually that's part of Southeast Alaska, which is the US, but also part of British Columbia, the wolves are under terrible assault there um, with logging of the Tongass National Forest, which brings roads in, which brings hunters and trappers in. Uh, it destroys the deer population that they survive on, the Sitka black-tailed deer, and the wolves are very heavily trapped there. So um, in various parts of Canada, there really are not the protections that are needed for wolves. They don't have an Endangered Species Act like we have here. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to be a wolf there. And then you might say, well, then how is it that they have 50 to 60,000 wolves there? Uh, it's because there are vast areas of Canada where people don't live. You know, if you leave people, uh, if you leave wolves alone, they will thrive and they will prosper. <laughs> Again, this goes back to humans are actually the worst safety risk for wolves of all. Most folks live around the 39th parallel. Yes, it's nicely packed in along the border. That's right. But um, I think I think we've uh, we've got to let you go at some point, Amarok. And I would like to thank you on behalf of all the attendees and and the friends and myself and Adrian for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. I mean, it's so informative, so so absolutely fascinating, and and. Um, and I will let fo uh, people know that yes, this lecture is being recorded. It is going to be available on the Friends website. So if you wish to see it, hear it again to see those videos, because I don't think that there is any more to the videos than what Amarok gave me, but I'm not sure, uh, Amarok, is there more? To those videos, can is there are they longer videos anywhere or are these? So, yes, so the video I shared at the very end comes from a PBS.org nature special called Valley of the Wolves that came out, gosh, probably 15, 20 years ago. That is a beautiful entire film. That's just a short clip I shared from that. So folks might want to go see the whole film. There were several of them. You can find them online. Uh, the other film clip of the last impact. There's not like a longer video of that, but if folks go to the Gray Wolf webpage for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, you can just type that in, California Department of Fish and Wildlife Gray Wolves, that will get you to their website. And once you're on their website, you can shop around the Gray Wolf webpage and you will see that they have other photos posted there. They have a few other videos posted there. Um, they have a way that you can sign up to get notified by them when they're uh, doing issuing new quarterly reports and things. I encourage people to do that because it's a great way to keep up with what, ha with what is happening with wolves in California. Mm. Well, we will definitely keep our, our eyes on um, OR93 and see what, what adventures he has and, uh, ho and hope, 
hope to heaven that he stays safe and finds a mate. Right. And, Fingers crossed. Yes, indeed. And again, many, many thanks for a most informative and, and just absolutely fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of you for being here. And thank you, Francis San Pedro Valley Park, for inviting me. It was wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. Wow. Okay. So I'll end this. Yeah.